Thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for so many of you who've been at all five of these sessions. I mentioned to your pastor this morning that I'm already tired of hearing myself talk. I can only imagine how you feel the same. Five sessions is a lot, but thank you for participating throughout the weekend in this conference where we focused on the mission of God and then our response to it. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. As we consider this message entitled Hope for the Hurting, and we make this last session of our conference perhaps the most personal, as we look at a story in which Jesus fulfilled his mission by intersecting with the life of a hurting person and bringing hope into his life. We're going to look at this story from three different lenses. We're going to look at it, first of all, through the eyes of the person receiving ministry, then through the eyes of the one giving the ministry, and then we're going to look at it through the eyes of the instruction that was given that applies perhaps to all of us here this morning. Mark chapter 1, the end of the chapter, tells the story of Jesus' encounter with an, with an anonymous man He's never named in the Bible, only known by his disease. And yet his story is so important that it's included in three of the Gospels. I'm talking about a man we know simply as the leper. Mark chapter 1, verse 39. Jesus went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then, a man with leprosy, came to him, and on his knees begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Then, then, Jesus sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest <clears throat> and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places and they came to him from everywhere. We start considering this story by looking at it through the eyes of this man known as the leper. This man was hurting. He was in great pain. His pain was really from at least three sources. First, he was obviously hurting physically. He had leprosy. Now, leprosy in the Bible was a word used to describe any range of skin ailments. In modern medical terminology, Hansen's, or leprosy is called Hansen's disease. It certainly means that, but in the Bible it could have meant a broader range of skin ailments. It could have meant skin cancers, bleeding sores, pus-filled abscesses, nasty rotting flesh, tumors growing on the skin. It might have even meant something like shingles or a pox. Sounds gross, doesn't it? By any description, this man was in physical pain. He had leprosy. He had a chronic, persistent, no doubt painful and unsightly disease. Now the Bible prescribed some treatment for these people. Not medical, but that leads us to the second source of his pain, social. This man was a social outcast. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. If you had leprosy, 
Not only were you in physical pain, but you were also so suffering as a social outcast. If you had leprosy, you had to live away from people. How far? As far as the sound of your voice would carry. So if I'm a leper and I see you on the horizon, I yell out, unclean, unclean. And if you can hear my voice, you're supposed to back away. No one was to be any closer to this man than the sound of his voice could carry. This guy invented social distancing. You think you've had it bad. For a few months, you had to stay six feet away from every other person. Imagine this man having to stay as far away as the sound of the carry of his voice for the rest of his life. Think about it. Never ever sharing a meal with another human being. Never getting a pat on the back from a friend. Never a hug from a loved one. If you're in my stage of life, Never having a grandchild crawl up in your lap and say, Granddaddy, read me a book. Never, ever again in the physical presence of another human being. This man is hurting physically. He is hurting socially. Because of this second situation, he's also hurting spiritually. He can't go to synagogue or to temple. He can't gather like you're doing right now. He can't come and hear singing, hear scripture read, hear someone try to explain it like I'm doing right now. Oh, he might sneak in out on the horizon somewhere and hope that the sound of a voice or a song or a psalm might carry out there to where he is. But the idea of coming into a worship service like this one and sharing fellowship, laughing at a story, catching up on someone's life situation, praying with someone, out totally, completely, spiritually separated from the people. I'm trying to paint a bleak picture for you this morning because this is the way this poor man lived. He was in physical pain. He was socially isolated. He was spiritually rejected. And yet, and yet in his desperation, he broke all the rules. What did he do? It says, then a man with leprosy, verse 40, came to him. He broke his way through the crowd. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Get back, get back, it's a leper, it's a leper. As this man came through the crowd, disheveled, broken, nasty, living alone all this time. And he got up close to Jesus and knelt down and said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. In that moment, Jesus made a significant choice. Jesus touched him. He touched him. He also broke all the rules. And in that moment, Jesus did the unthinkable. <coughs> he touched a leper. Now you're thinking, well, of course, he's Jesus. But let me remind you, Jesus did not have to touch anyone to heal them. Jesus could have eye-blinked him, and he would have been healed. <laughs> Jesus could have given him the head bob. He would have been healed. Magic fingers? A wink? Do you understand that Jesus could have simply thought 
the thought of healing, and this man would have been healed instantly, but Jesus did not do that instead. Jesus did the unthinkable. This poor, broken, disheveled, isolated, rejected man is kneeling in front of him, and Jesus reaches out and touched him. And in that moment communicated so much about his response to hurting people. Now this got me thinking. Did Jesus ever touch anyone else? So I studied all the stories in the Bible of Jesus touching another person. I found out Jesus was touching people all the time. For example, there's a story that says Jesus put his finger in a man's ear and restored his hearing. Another time, Jesus touched a man's eye and gave him back his sight. Another time, the Bible says Jesus touched a man on the lips and restored his speech. And another time, touched him on the tongue, got him right on the tongue and restored his speech. And then one of my favorites, near at the end of Jesus' life, one of his followers whipped out a sword, flicked off a guy's ear. Jesus picked that up and stuck it on the bloody stump. I'm telling you, Jesus walked around with ear wax eye gunk, snot, spit, and blood on his hands from touching, hurting people. Jesus' power is available to and can restore any hurting person. No person too broken too defiled, too nasty, too evil, no person beyond the touch of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, Paul writes the church and says this, Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And then the next great verse, and some of you used to be like this. That's you, by the way, in this room this morning. You, you're immoral, you're greedy, you're cheats, you've done despicable things sexually and morally, you've, in, you've been drunk, you've been verbally abusive. This is us, or at least what we used to be, because now listen to the last part of the verse, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Do you understand this great truth that no person is too broken to be beyond the touch of Jesus Christ and that when he touches a person, he transforms everything about their wicked past into something beautiful and right and good and godly and that's who we are. And may we never forget this picture of this leper and the transformation that took place when Jesus touched him. What made that touch possible? Quiet desperation. He was willing to break all the rules and come to Jesus and get down on his knees and say, if you could, if you're willing, if you please, heal me. What does quiet desperation look like today? Did people have to fight their way through a crowd or make a scene out of themselves or get as bad as physically as this leper? What, what does it look like today? Well, let me just give you one story. I was a pastor, uh, a young pastor in my 20s in my very first church. There was a man in our community. He was in his 50s. He was a successful businessman, person of means, beautiful home, nice cars, fancy vacations. His wife was a member of our church. He attended occasionally, but never had really clearly identified himself as a Christian and a member of our church. I always knew there was something holding him back, but I wasn't sure quite what it was. I tried to befriend him, reach out to him, build a relationship with him, but not much happened. A few years went by. One Friday, I left the church early. I was having a light day. 
went home for an early lunch, stayed a little long, came back about 1.30. This man was sitting outside my office on a little bench. Now, ladies, you know what I mean. The, the, the women of our church had put this little bench and some de decoration outside my office to make it a little more attractive. This was a looking bench, not a sitting bench. Do you know what I mean? Just a little, little decorative bench, little flowers, little things. He was sitting on that little bench like a child with his knees together and his hands in his lap. I came around the corner. I said, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were coming by. He said, I didn't call. I said, I left a little early. He said, I came by just about noon. I hoped I'd catch you before you left, but I knew I would wait for you until you came back. I said, wow, you've been here a long time. I'm so sorry. He said, that's fine. And then he said this phrase. He said, I had to wait because I knew it was either today or it never would happen for me. I need to talk to you. And we went in my office, and he unburdened this thing which was keeping him from committing himself to God. And it's not what you think. It wasn't a woman, and it wasn't sexual. It was something else entirely. In fact, when he unburdened himself to me, it shocked me. I was not expecting it, nor would I have ever thought of it as the problem. But he unburdened himself that day, confessed his sin, asked me to help him. And I did help him pray and commit his life to Jesus Christ that day. His life was transformed. He went on to become a very active leader in our church, ultimately chaired a building committee that built our facility some years later, a remarkable transformation in his life. It all started, though, with what? Quiet desperation. A man, respected, older, successful, coming to a very young pastor and sitting on a little bench until he could get the help he needed to give his life to God. Listen here this morning. If you're here today and you're hurting, I'm not going to ask you to do something outrageous or outlandish. You don't have to make a show out of it. Nobody has to see except you and God. But by some means, you're going to have to humble yourself today and in quiet desperation, Say to him, I need you. And whatever that act of quiet desperation looks like for you, take it today. A leper came through a crowd. My friend sat on a little bench. Whatever you have to do today to say, I humble myself and in quiet desperation, I come to God. Do it today. And Jesus promises he'll touch you just like he's touched so many of us in this room and change our lives forever. Well, that's the story of this leper through his eyes. But now let's look at it through another lens. Many of you in this room have already had this experience I'm describing, and now you're trying to reach out to people who are hurting. Well, let's look at how Jesus did that. Notice what it says about him in verse 41. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. Now, we sometimes in church use this analogy. We say that we're the hands and feet of Jesus. We go and do in the name of Jesus. And that's a good analogy and a good illustration. That's what this whole missions conference has been about. I've been challenging you to go and to do, to go into the communities where you live and into the world around us and even into the world at large and do what? Share the good news of Jesus Christ by telling people how they can understand the gospel and come to faith in Christ. Go and do as the hands and feet of Jesus. But now let me talk with you about what motivates you to do that. What is it that motivates you to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to go and to do what, he's do, what he wants done in our world today? Well, there's some things we try to use, they don't work. Guilt. That's a bad motivator. Here's another one, shame. That's also a bad motivator. Guilt, shame. Then we turn it to the positive. Well, let's use rewards like money and recognition. Are you seriously kidding me? There's not that much money in the ministry and there's not that much recognition to go around. <laughs> so, if guilt and shame and money and recognition are not going to motivate us to be the hands and feet of Jesus going and doing what he needs done in the world today, what is it 
Well, it's right here in the text. What does it say about Jesus? Verse 41. Moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. What motivated Jesus to do what he did, break all the rules, touch this leper, heal him in that moment, what motivated Jesus was not guilt or shame or money or recognition. It was compassion. Now let's talk about compassion for a moment. Because compassion used in our modern understanding is not the same thing as was meant by the word in the New Testament era. Today, we think of compassion as something on a Hallmark uh, Channel movie or something on a sappy greeting card we get at Christmas. Compassion. Aw. Sweet. Kind. Cuddly. Well, I like sweet. I like kind. I even like cuddly. I'm married, so of course I've watched a few Hallmark movies. I don't mind all of those feelings. Occasionally, I even like to get a sappy card. But that's not compassion. In the biblical world and in the use of the word, the word compassion literally means, work with me now, the word compassion literally means a stirring or a rumbling in the gut. It means a churning in your bowels. It means a grumbling, something deep down inside of you. That's compassion. It literally means rumbling in the gut, bubbling in the bowels, stirring in the stomach, in the inner being of who you are. And it's something that comes up within you that moves and rumbles and percolates and finally moves you to take some action. It's actually a word in the biblical understanding that's more closely related to the word anger in our culture. Now, don't misunderstand me. Compassion and anger are not the same thing, but I'm trying to give you some analogy to help you understand here. In our world, we say someone is what? Boiling with anger. Have you heard that? Someone is seething with anger, right? All right. Someone is going to what? Blow up in anger. Why? Because we recognize anger as something that happens deep within a person that bubbles and cooks and simmers and stews until finally it comes up out of them some way and motivates them to take action, usually negative action. Compassion is like anger in that sense. It's something deep within you. It's something that stirs you on the inside. It's something that wells up and motivates you, drives you, compels you, propels you, compels you. It pushes you to take action in a positive way. So what will keep you going in ministry to hurting people is not guilt or shame or recognition or money. What will keep you going is the compassion of Jesus working through you. So I want to challenge you this morning to have the courage to pray and say, Lord Jesus, would you put your compassion for hurting people inside of me? Would you put something deep inside of me that I really can't explain or understand that can only come from you? But would you put compassion inside of me? Not some touchy-feely thing that will go away in five minutes, but something that's deeper than that. Something that moves me, that motivates me, that percolates inside of me, that cooks and simmers and bubbles and just moves me along and keeps me going and compels me to take action and will sustain me over a lifetime of caring for hurting people. I became a Christian 50 years ago this year as a 13-year-old teenager. And I became a minister about 40 years ago as a young adult. One of the constants I've observed in all of those years is there is no shortage of hurting people. Every day I wake up to a neighborhood, a community, and a world full of more and more pain. It can be overwhelming, can't it? 
And as a ministering person, as a Christian, as a part of this church who's trying to do something about this, you can have something that's a real thing. It's called compassion fatigue. You just run out of energy for the task. You just can't do any more. There are so many broken people, so many addicts, so many people struggling with illness, so many mentally ill people, so many people that are uh, in broken relationships, so many people that are having financial setbacks, that are losing jobs, that are getting kicked out of school, that aren't getting into the school they want, that are struggling with so many issues and difficulties, and we are trying to minister to them in the name of Jesus, and it's like trying to move into a tsunami of pain that's washing over us in the lives of people. What will keep you going? The compassion of Jesus. And so I ask you today, if you're a Christian ministering person here today, to have the courage to say, put your compassion in me, Jesus, and keep me going so that I will keep touching, hurting people in your name as you did with that leper. And now we come to the end of the conference and the end of this sermon and the third way I want to look at this passage. And that is the very puzzling conclusion. And especially it's a puzzling conclusion for a missions conference. So the leper is healed and then Jesus gives him some interesting instructions. What does he say? Verse 43. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone. What? Here's a healed leper. And Jesus says, go home and keep it quiet. Don't tell anybody. What? This is the same Jesus who's going to tell us at a later point in his ministry, go tell the whole world about me. So here he is at the beginning of his ministry telling the leper, Keep it quiet. Don't tell anybody. Go home. Does this not puzzle you? It puzzles me. It baffles me. And it gets worse. Look what he told him next. He said, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. In other words, go find a priest at the temple and offer a thanksgiving sacrifice for healing. That's what he means. Go and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing. In other words, in the law of the Old Testament, there were offerings prescribed that you gave to God as a thanksgiving offering for physical healing. Go make one of those offerings. Now, this is also puzzling. The leper just broke all the rules, including the book of Leviticus, when he came and knelt down in front of Jesus. And Jesus himself just broke all the rules when he touched a leper. So he says to the leper, go home, don't tell anybody. And even though we just both broke all the rules, go keep the rules. Go find a priest and make an offering in the temple. Is this not confusing? Go tell the whole world, but don't tell anybody right now. We're going to break all the rules, but go keep all the rules. I've heard some interesting interpretations of this passage. Here's my favorite. Someone once told me, Jesus was using reverse psychology. <laughs> he knew that the leper would do the opposite, so he tricked him. Well, there's only one problem with that, and Jesus is not a trickster, is he? Jesus is not a game player. He's not a manipulator. I don't think Jesus even knows what reverse psychology is in that moment, if you know what I mean. So what's happening here? Here's what I believe is the better interpretation. Jesus tells this leper, go home and offer a sacrifice and keep it quiet because I don't need what you're going to accomplish for me. What he accomplished was drawing a big crowd. Now listen carefully. But at this stage of Jesus' life, the crowds were coming for the loaves and fishes, the sideshow attraction. They wanted to see the circus that was rolling through town. 
they were not coming. They were not coming, for the most part, as people seeking a discipled life with Jesus. Jesus said to the leper, in essence, I don't need help drawing a crowd. I'll take care of that at a later time. I don't need a throng of people moving me into the desert because they all want to see some spectacular thing that may happen next. I don't need that. But here's what I do need. I need you to model for me what I'm really after, and that is obedience. I need you to do what I say. I don't need you to do what you think is going to help me out. Now, church, listen to me. This gets serious. The end of this message is Jesus says to every one of you, what I need you to do is obey me. I don't need any of your creative ideas about what you can do to help me out. I need you to obey me. On the macro, this happens when individual Christians start thinking up ways to live their lives so that they can somehow impress God. You don't want to do that. Just get on your knees and say, God, what do you want me to do? And then get up and do it. On the macro or the bigger scale, it's when a church or a culture starts redefining what the Bible clearly teaches about things like gender and marriage and morality and saying, oh, no, this is what the Bible really meant about that. Or, oh, the Bible really doesn't have anything clearly to say about that when it absolutely does. We're trying to help God out by clearing things up. Do you track what I'm saying? Jesus is telling us on the micro individually and on the macro as a culture, I don't need your help. I need your obedience. I don't need you to think up ways to do what you think needs to be done. I need you to listen carefully and do what I'm telling you to do. That's what he told the leper. So here's where we end this conference. At a point of obedience. Will you do what you have been impressed during these three days together is your responsibility of obedience to God? Will you change your lifestyle, become more vocal in your witness, give more money to missions, plant your life in another country or culture? I don't know what it is that God is saying to each one of you as he moves around the room as a result of these three days together. But if you've been here and you've been seeking and listening, he is saying something to you. He's impressing you in your spirit with a clear impression of what he wants you to do. He's put that thought in your mind through my preaching or through the singing or through the sharing in the four years between services. But you know, you know as a result of this conference what you're supposed to do. Do it. Do it. Don't try to explain it away. Don't try to rationalize it. Don't try to fix it up or clean it up or make it different. Just do it. Just be like the leper. And when Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. Go home, keep it quiet, and make an offering for your healing. That's all I need. Well, the leper didn't do it. He went out, told the whole world. Crowds came. Jesus was forced out of the villages into the countryside. People mobbing him. Hey, let's see a healing. Woohoo! Break out those loaves and fishes, man. We're hungry. <laughs> Jesus wanted none of that because he wasn't interested in a mob. He was interested in obedient disciples. And he still is. Let's bow our heads together. With our heads bowed now, I want us to have a few moments of prayerful reflection. So would you just spend time praying quietly this morning as I lead you? First of all, would you thank Jesus that he touched your life one day? If you're here and you're already a Christian, you were a hurting person with all kinds of sin and evil and wicked difficulty in your life, and Jesus touched you. Thank him for that. Man. What a difference he's made. Now, if you're here this morning and you are hurting, 
and you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, just pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, right now I turn from my sin and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. A very simple prayer like that, a prayer of quiet desperation, will launch you on a new trajectory as Jesus comes into your life and changes you forever. You say, is it really that simple? It really is. And if you're praying a prayer like that, come to a pastor or a deacon, a youth minister, a Sunday school teacher, a Christian friend in this room and say, today I prayed and committed my life to Jesus Christ. Help me know what to do next. And they will. Now, if you're here today and you're a person in this church who tries to minister to hurting people, would you have the courage just, just now to pray and ask for the compassion of Jesus to be put into your life? Move away from guilt and shame and money and recognition. These things won't last. Ask instead for compassion to be rooted deep within you and to become the driving force of your ministry life. And now finally, how has God impressed you during this conference? Change your lifestyle, become more missional, missional focused, be more vocal about sharing your faith, join in an outreach project, go on a mission trip, commit your life to missions, give more to missions. What is he saying to you? Obey him. Get up from your seat in just a moment and start going in the direction of obedience. And ask God to help you along the way. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the story of this leper. Thank you for the way we can see it through these different lenses. Thank you that he shows us how much you care about hurting people and how you can transform us into your followers. Thank you so much. Thank you also that his story teaches us about the compassion of Jesus, and I pray that you would put that compassion into my life and make me more compassionate toward hurting people. And then, Father, at the end of this story, <laughs> Jesus gave some remarkable instructions. Use those instructions to motivate us to be obedient, to do what you say, not what anyone else says, and to give us the courage to do that as we wrap up this time together. Heavenly Father, thank you for these dear people in this wonderful church, and thank you for the ministry they have across this community and around the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit's power and blessing on them and expand their work in ways they could have never imagined or understood. And we receive it from you in Jesus' name. Amen.